the Sackett family, members of Saving Grace Lutheran Church. Enjoy our service today. Uh, our Lenten uh, series has begun. Things that bring you closer to Jesus. And we'll be looking at those, uh, those different things that uh, bring us closer to Jesus. What does it mean as we are called to follow him? And, um, and the first thing that we'll be looking at is the very center of every single worship service, which is the word and how that brings us closer to Christ. So um, with that, why don't we stand as we begin our worship on this first Sunday of Lent. We begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Second reading comes to us from Roman, uh, Paul's letter to the Romans, which, which is from the 10th chapter, beginning with the 8th verse. The Lord is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says that no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call upon him. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. And then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone that I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And then the devil took him to Jerusalem. He placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you and in their hands they will bear you up, so you will not dash your foot against the stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I went over to, I was at a, a nursing home the other day, and I walked in and I said, um, how are you girls doing? And they said, what? And I said, how are you girls doing? And they said, pretty good. And I said, well, we might get some snow. And they said, that's a bad word, they said. <laughs> you should watch your mouth, they said. You know, um, snow. What, what about snow? Huh? There's something great about snow in the sense that, uh, you know, when everything gets dirty, it looks bad outside, and the snow drifts, you can see all the salt and everything. Now everything's going to be pristine. And it's kind of neat because everything gets quiet after a snow. If we could just stay and think about the good things, maybe it would make it a little bit easier. It was uh, Lenora that told me that people have a sense of humor, which is good to see, she said. She saw in one snowbank, uh, there was uh, painted, what did it say on the painting? It said spray painting said free. Spray, praying, spray painting free, yeah. <laughs> like getting dirt, yeah. So it said on the snowbank they could have that snowbank for free. Isn't that nice? Yeah. <laughs> there was another, there was a hump in the road and it had a stick in it and a little sign on top 
that said buried car. <laughs> well, the thaw's coming, you know. It'll, they'll get it out eventually. You know, um, it gives us a different perspective on life. That's the nice thing about snow. Whenever something changes, that's the beautiful thing about the seasons, actually. You have spring that kind of, it, uh, things uh, start to come to life and everything looks different. And then you have summer in which you can enjoy the days and, and then you have the huge mosquitoes that can carry people away. And then you have uh, fall where, where the leaves change and, and everything looks beautiful again. And, and then winter comes and, and it seems to, uh, you know, just, it feels beautiful, crisp, nice. No. Yeah, well, that's because you went on vacation. You never go on vacation during the winter. Then you expect more, see. There were a few men's uh, 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 people that had got together. They were geniuses. They got together. They went to a restaurant, and, and they sat down at the table, a group of about five, six uh, Mensa students, or not students. They were just in Mensa. I mean, they were geniuses. Sat down, and they looked, and they said, you know what? The salt is in the pepper shaker, and the pepper is in the salt shaker. And they said, you know, we're geniuses. We could figure this out. Let's figure it out. And they did. They figured out in five steps they could uh, make everything just right, and just using a straw and a napkin. Pretty good. I tried to figure out how they would have done that, and I couldn't do it, so I guess I'm not a genius. And so they, uh, they decided that they would test the, the, the um, waitress as she came forward uh, to her, the table. They said, hey, you know, we noticed that the salt is in the pepper, and they didn't even finish. She said, oh, I'm sorry. I just filled those this morning. She unscrewed the caps and switched the caps and put it back. And they sat there dumbfounded. Sometimes the new perspective comes from someone that doesn't think, you know, into the problem so much. It's something very simple. The answer is, is uh, much more simpler than we could ever imagine. And here's how simple it is when they bring the fruits, first fruits to, um, to, to God. When you come into the land that the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance to possess, and when you possess it and settle in it, you shall take some of the first fruits of the ground which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God has given you, and you shall put it in a basket, and you shall go to the place that the Lord your God has chosen as a dwelling place for his name. And you shall go to the priest who is in office at the time and say to him, now listen to this, today I declare to you, the Lord your God, that, um, that you have, uh, we have come into the land that the Lord swore to our ancestor to ancestors to give us. Throughout this whole reading, the, em the emphasis is on what the Lord has done. See? The Lord has given them the land, the Lord has provided for them. The Lord has, has done everything for them. A wandering Aramean was my ancestor, and yet the Lord brought them out of, out of uh, slavery, out of Egypt, with an outstretched, outstretched arm and a display of terrifying power and signs and wonders, brought us to a land of flowing, flowing with milk and honey. The Lord has given them everything, and so they give the first fruits. But the emphasis on what is on what the Lord has done, not what they had done, what the Lord had done in their lives. It's a new perspective. Often when we go through life, we say, well, wait a second, this is my hard-earned money, so I have to make sure. You know, I, I went to, uh, uh, my computer died, and so I went to um, get it diagnosed, and they said the whole motherboard fried out. <clears throat> I said, it fried out? And they said, yep, it's fried out, so um, you might as well just buy a new one. I said, really? I kind of liked it, you know? I get used to something, and then, so that's why I always back everything today, because um, you never know what's going to happen. And so um, the guy was telling me all about this computer, which looked like it was from the 1980s, and it was heavier than, you know, a brick. And um, he said it's a really good deal, and it's really it's hardy and sturdy and everything. And even to this day, I'm kind of wondering, well, wait a second. Is it just a computer from the 80s that they redid? I don't know. It's, hard -earned, it's my hard-earned money. 
I don't want anybody to take advantage of me. And yet what I forget is that, no, the Lord has given this to me. Everything that I have has been given to me from the Lord. And so I should start with that perspective. That is, that it, this is the Lord's. And so I'm called to be a steward of what the Lord has given me. And, and maybe I should still be thrifty because it's something that the Lord has given me. And I should make sure that I can help out others. See, It's a different perspective than that of the world. And yet in that perspective, we find a peace. Now, when Jesus is tempted in the wilderness, there, uh, and, and I know this is aired on TV, so I won't, I won't say um, all the things that I normally say when it's not aired. <laughs> How's that? So if you want the unabridged edition, then come on Saturday night, and you can hear the unabridged edition. Does the Lord ever lead us into temptation? Here it is. Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan. He was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. Do you think that the Lord knew that he would be tempted by the devil for 40 days in the wilderness? Yeah. Did he lead him into temptation? Yeah. Why? Because this was an opportunity for him to, to say that, no, I will follow the Lord. I will follow God, my God, who is God. See? Jesus, the Word, is God. And so he wasn't going to depart from God. It was the temptation. So we actually pray, lead us not into temptation. Why? Because the truth is we don't want to be tempted beyond what we can handle. And so we know that the Lord always gives us what we can. When he was out in the wilderness, then the devil came. Now he is tempted for 40 days. We only get a little snippet of the. We get three different temptations that take place. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Now, he had every, every right to say, Well, wait a second. You know, David... And his army was hungry, and they went into the, into the temple, and they actually took bread from the altar, and he gave it to the men, and he himself ate. So why can't I provide for myself? I mean, there is there's scriptural reference to that. He could do that. He could have engaged the, the devil and said, well, well, I am the son of, of God. I am, I am who I say that I am, and yet you don't believe. Why don't you believe? And he says... But he doesn't do any of that. What he does is he quotes scripture to, to Satan, to the devil, and puts him in his place. He says, one does not live by bread alone. Now, if we were to read the very next part of that, but by everything that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. See? That is, we have no existence separate from who the Lord is. He provides for absolutely everything. One does not live by bread alone, but by everything that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. That is, our, He is our sustenance. He is the one who provides for us. He is the one that, even in the midst of a snowstorm, He still gives us hope. Isn't that amazing? He is always there to give us, give us strength from day to day, and no matter what happens in our life, he is there to encourage us so that we know that we're never, ever alone. This is the Lord. And so um, he says, you know, this is the first time that he can say as the Son of God, he could seize his own authority and say, you know what? I do have the authority. I could turn those stones into the loaves of bread, and I am famished. But he, he says it is less important that I do what I may want to do Instead, I will live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord, for one does not live by bread alone. See? Second time, the devil came to him. And he showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give all their glory and, and all this authority, for it has been given over to me. He said. And I will give you or give it to anyone that I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Now, 
I was reading a, a New Testament uh, scholar, David, uh, David Tede, and David Tede says, um, first of all, when did the devil ever uh, become credible in what he had to say, you know? When do you ever believe what the devil says? And here's the, here's the beauty of it. He doesn't have authority over this earth. He, he points to the fact that in scriptures it revealed that there are other gods and powers, but they are all subordinate. Even in the Old Testament, all these idols are subordinate to God himself. That is, that God claims dominion on everything on earth and in heaven. The only authority that the devil has is that which the Lord provides. So remember when he tested Job? And uh, he said, do you know of anyone that's righteous? And, and the Lord said, have you considered my servant Job? And he said, oh. Well, I'll bet you that he'll leave you. He won't believe in you. He'll renounce you. And he said, well, you can do anything to him except do not take his life, he said. The only authority that the devil had was, was given to him. We understand that the Lord guides us. And so Jesus says, now there's another thing that's at stake. If he says, bows down and worships the devil or Satan, then he actually leaves the protection of God. And he is no longer God's son, but the illegitimate son of the devil. And all authority, all the plan, all redemption is gone. But he doesn't even take the bait. He says, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Now, there, I, was, uh, I was talking to someone who the, the, earlier this week, and they said they had this really cool uh, interpretation of these three different te- the, the three different temptations, and they said, you know, it's dealing with this, this, and this. And I said, well, that's really neat. And I tried to put it together and try to understand it, and, and uh, I thought it was nice and nifty, but it didn't quite work for me. So um, Jesus is actually being tested Will you follow? Will you be subordinate to, to God, even though he is God? Here he is, the Word. Jesus is the Word made flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And all things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. And that which has come into being in him was life, it says in John chapter 1 and uh, following. And then it says in verse 14, the word became flesh and lived among us. The word, Jesus, became flesh and lived among us. And we beheld his glory as of the glory of the only begotten of the Father. That is, when we look to Jesus, we see the Father. We see who God is. And so here it is, Jesus uh, Jesus is being tested by the devil. And what does Jesus do? He quotes the word. Beautiful. He never engages with him. He never says, well, wait a second. I am actually the son of, man, uh, son of God, and, and I am the Messiah, and yes, I have authority to do that, and no, that authority is not yours. It's God's. He never engages like that. He says, worship. He says, one does not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And then the third testing is this. He goes to Jerusalem. Now, when is he going to go to Jerusalem? At the end. And it's there that he will be judged. And the devil took him to Jerusalem, the place on the pinnacle of the temple, and said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written that he will command his angels concerning to protect you. And on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash a foot against the stone. Now, here's the deal. Um, David Tede says the interpretation that the devil has of this scripture is is laughable. That is not how that scripture is supposed to be used. And he said this should be actually um, um, a warning to us that we shouldn't take scripture out of context and quote it for our own own, uh, needs. I thought that was really good. And Jesus answered him, 
do not put the Lord your God to the test. Because what the devil is testing right there is whether or not he can um, usurp God's authority or Jesus could usurp God's authority and say, you know, Lord, let's see if you'll come through. But he wouldn't have it. What does this say to us? Are there any times in our lives that we say, you know what, Um, I deserve this. I've worked for this. And I think that I need this. Instead of, one does not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Are there times in our lives where we, where we think, you know what, I have the authority to do this. Actually, I have the power to do this. I actually was, as I was writing the sermon, thinking about the sermon, I was, I was saying to myself, well, maybe I shouldn't cancel tomorrow because maybe I'm, um, um, I'm asserting my authority where I shouldn't, you know? But are there any times that we ever assert our authority or our position and we say, no, you can't do that, and you can't do that because I say you can't, you know? I think about that also when I'm with little Magnus, who's two years old. And if I say yes or no, that's what it is. There'll come a time when he's 16. (laughs) And you know what? He's already in his twos, so he already says no. I say yes, and he says no. And I say good, (laughs) which confuses him. But at least he's he's becoming, uh, becoming an individual. That's good. They have to do that. And yet, there are times in our lives where we wish to assert our authority and say, wait a second, that's not right. You've, you've wronged me, and I, I need to get this right in our lives. And so we, we say, um, we're going to do it this way. Are we ever tempted to do that? Are we ever tempted to test the Lord and say, Lord, you know, I need this in my life, and I really need... Uh, this particular thing, and so, um, you know what? If you're real, I want you to show that you're real. Do we ever do that? Does he have to prove that he's real? No. I'd have to say in all those things, I've failed. In every way, Jesus was tempted as we are, and yet was without sin. And he came and offered himself for us so that we might have eternal life in his name. So that every every tongue confess, every tongue that confess that Jesus is Lord and believes in their heart that Jesus, God raised him from the dead will be saved. You see, that's our hope. That's what Christ has done. There's nothing greater than that. The difference between a doubt and an unbelief is doubt is a matter of the mind. We cannot understand what God is doing or why he's doing it. That's why we doubt. Unbelief is this. It's a matter of the will. We refuse to believe God's word, and we refuse to obey it, what he tells us to do. It's a matter of the will. Doubt may not always be a sign that a man is wrong. Are you writing this down, women? Doubt may not always be a sign that a man is wrong. It might be a sign that he's thinking. Isn't that good? I thought that was pretty good. So the truth is, I'm usually thinking. (laughs) But um, most importantly, we don't place a question mark where God puts a period. And where God uh, reveals in the scriptures what he is doing, he always puts a period. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. One does not live by bread alone. The word is near you. It's on your lips and in your heart, the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so I saw a woman that had a stroke. It was a few years back. Read to her, it was right around Christmas. Read to her the Christmas story. And after the Christmas story, I said, we're going to pray for healing because that's what we pray for. And they didn't think that she'd recover. She hadn't said anything. And um, we, uh, I said, well, I'm going to just ask you um, what we normally do in the service. 
Um, that is when we ask for healing. Do you renounce all the forces of evil, the devil, and all of his empty promises? And you know what she said? She said, I renounce them, clearly. When she could barely say a word. I was blown away. Geared up. Only God can do this, see. And we prayed for healing. It was a few weeks later that she passed away. But you know what? She confessed with her lips. I renounce them. So we do in our lives. Every single day. And we are tested. And sometimes we think it's just too much. But we can go to the Lord and say, Lord, give me and give me what I need. Sustain me so that I don't grow weary. Remind me that you are Lord of all and that you're in control. Because the word is near you. It's on your lips and in your heart. And the one who puts his trust in the Lord will never be put to shame. You know, that's a new perspective. So be it, Lord. Amen. Body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in His grace now unto everlasting life. Amen. And let us pray. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. We pray, Lord, that you would always give us new perspective, that we would look to your word to guide us, to lead us. And we pray that in your mercy you would strengthen us through this gift, this holy communion, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another, for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Be to God.